uh, myself. Um, so others who want to talk, I don't know if Mark has anything. Let's see for a bit. And uh, there's a bit of consolidation. I'm, I was looking at Spark on that. Oh, but if you want to talk, go ahead. Um, <laughs> no. But I mean, I'm, I'm essentially um, just willing to, uh, I guess, uh, for me, if anybody else has anything else to talk about. Um, I think one of the things we talked about yesterday a little bit was sharing device trees. We're just going to solve that. We're going to put it somewhere on our own community tree or on our tree. Um, let's sort that out. I don't think it's really worth talking too much about it. I was, I was here yesterday, so yeah. can you summarize? So, so the plan is to just use device drivers and their drivers. So we missed, a, we missed a lot of plans. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the, the, that attitude has always been there for a bit, that everything should be, there should be no mark driver. Yeah. I think I've seen every single vendor tree that enables 64 bit still has a mark driver because they're carrying stuff over from 32 bit. Yeah. But, um, We've started to see more and more of them empty out of 32 bit. So uh, hopefully, you know, as people empty out of 32 bit, they can be able to spread it. But well, I, I think it should be confirmed that I think all the on the A's can boost to pretty much the use space with timers and neurons without any time of machines. So I think uh it's also different. I see Mark so that is the, the ideal case. Right. And yeah. I would like to see, if possible, also SMP working without yeah. machine-specific SMP implementations, yeah. because that's just a world of pain. The ARM64 boot protocol is currently outside of the kernel is where coherency is managed, because we boot in a non-secure world, we don't have access to all that secure stuff. So if you're developing an SOC and you have space, please implement something like PSCI, which will mean you will get I mean, we have the trusted firmware on GitHub which implements this, and if you use that, you will get SMP support out of the box. Which is you will, but it's a very idealized world yep. for everybody. I know. That's, that's why I said it's the ideal case. So, if you have questions about SMP support and if you're not able to talk about them now, please come talk to me later. Mm -hmm. Uh, besides that discussion from yesterday was uh, the major topic was the right to and really the tree and nobody else has so, uh, Does anybody have anything else? So was there any kind of consensus reached on that stability discussion? Uh, in the room, yes. <laughs> Which was? <laughs> we don't know how to do it. <laughs> Which means we won't have claims well, on it. The, the one forcing factor to be one uh, like us is tired of seeing churn and fuel blow up at us. Okay. Which means that I've actually sent an email I'm going to reply yet to check for you guys. Because if he doesn't care, and he's a cave and asking me in tree, why should we ever move it out? Um, but yeah, that's all fucking cheap. We didn't require that yesterday. I would be very happy if we can require that the TTVs are always in the round. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about it. Go, go somewhere else and talk about that. Paul. Oh. Um, so the, I had two topics that we could discuss. One would be a um, continuation of part of what we had discussed with the Colonel Summit last year about um, the approach towards PSCI for SMP and uh, uh, what the thinking is we have seen some posts on the mailing list that suggest that there might be some approaches that are not PSCI. There will be not PSCI, but shortly there will be. And then um, secondly, I think I'm happy to chat a little bit about the drivers that we've seen. Sounds great, but I'm not going to talk about it. 
Sure. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think those are valid topics for this room. But yeah, we, I mean, and maybe I if anybody else has other topics that maybe it's in the fashion first, then we can come back to it. Sure. Yeah. 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 I hope the PSCI one will be relatively simple and uncomplicated. Maybe just being naive. So it, it, the R Mini Summit last year as part of the Edinburgh Colonel Summit, there was um, uh, there were some comments that from ARM primarily that they really, really, really wanted people to use PSCI um, for SMP control and seemed like there were some um, differences of interpretation as to whether anything else would even be considered or allowed. And so I guess to the extent that anybody here, I would be interested to hear um, for folks who are working on 64-bit um, ARM plans, if they are planning to use PSCI or if they're doing something else. And maybe if you want to talk about you know, your, the arm view of that, which I assume had not changed. That would be great. So does anybody else have, have any take on what they're going to be doing for PSCI? Or something PSCI like? Okay, so you're not surprised. <laughs> so the problem is getting people to even admit they're working on these permanent parts. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah. What's everybody doing? Yeah, can I just take my position on that? Please do, yeah. This is, is the, you should clarify whether it's your position or Catalan's or ARM's or... No, I think my position and Catalan's position are pretty much identical. Yeah. Um, whether or not it's what ARM corporate exactly think, I, I can't say because I never know. Um, but the ideal case, we don't want to have a plethora of different, arbitrarily different SMP boot protocols. That's, it's just painful. Um, ideally, you'd have PSCI. If you do that, you get SMP out of the box, you get hot plug out of the box, you get idle almost out of the box. It's being working at the moment. But even if you just have hot plug out of the box, that's a massive win for everyone. Uh, now, if you're not able to implement PSCI, or if you have reasons that if you have technical reasons against it, I'd be very interested in hearing about it because we'd like to work something out. Having a small number of relatively standardized boot pro uh, relatively standardized SMP boot mechanisms is far better than having an SF every single SOC having its own arbitrarily different one and having a different binding DT and all that. Um, the other thing is that PSCI is being used by more than just Linux now. So Zen uses it. So you can get Zen support for free if you have EL2 and PSCI, so that's nice. That's one of the, that's why I really like having PSCI. So uh, is the hypervisor trapping the, the PSCI calls in that case, basically? Yeah, so yeah. if you're using the hypervisor, we'll use uh, the HVC conduit for all the calls, and it provides its own virtual PSCI, and it will call the real PSCI when it wants to do hot plug, but the guest view, and then Zen turns around and uses the internal kernel hooks for, I mean, just when you say it's, we get it for free, I mean, I can understand that the, the guest OS is, whatever guest OS is running in a, a Zen or a hypervisor compartment is using you know, HVCs and gets that yep. for free, but it doesn't really impact what the, uh, the approach from the hardware is on. Uh, not sure what you mean by that. You know, well, I mean, for, so PSCI, Implementing PSCI requires some kind of firmware yep. right to be running to take to yep. is the other end to receive those PSCI calls. And I guess what my question was is is using Zen does that have any impact on on that hardware? Zen brings so up the physical cores with PSCI. Yeah, I think it's I see. The yeah, and at that point it will boot into your host operating system using which it will see the virtualized PSCI interface. It will do all the hardware access for loading memory, loading stuff off disk, whatever. So Zen doesn't really need to care about the underlying platform, which is a massive win. And then 
what every DSOS just sees a virtualized PSCI for the HPC conduit, which is completely unrelated to the real PSCI. Same on KVM. So one pet peeve of mine so far, yep. and I have been on many platforms implementing PSCI and they're stupid. Yep. Um, one of them is Almanac. Yep. And not PSCI used, PSCI actually broke there. I was not aware of that. Um, is here? There you are, right? Uh, I didn't not the on the Yeah. It's not working, right? Um, it depends on the set, actually. Yeah, but um, as you enable PSCI, the others, the rest of you, go ahead and do it, but please don't remove support for all stuff. Don't expect people to update firmware to run it in the I mean, that's just a thing that happens. If you want to enable it from get-go and support it, that's a great idea. If you ever need to ship one that doesn't have it, count on having to keep it around forever. Because people are just saying it's not going to be able to update firmware. No. Development board is short. Product is not short. Yeah. Yeah. So actually you'll notice in the boot wrapper that Catalan has on kernel.org, uh -huh. um, you can optionally enable PSCI support from there. Uh, using the DTB of the kernel, it automatically injects the nodes. Okay. So we don't modify the DT, but we have PSCI support there. Yeah, That's the it actually works in the old case, actually. Oh, yeah. If it has PSCI support, then it's basically what more uh, did for you use. Yeah. Uh, whenever it has PSCI support, it will pack the DTB. But we're explicit about enable methods on 64 bits, so that should be a fair and easy. Okay. So that's good. I mean, certainly I think PSCI is a good thing to follow if one has that, that firmware component that one is running, but at least there is the possibility that you would consider other, other approaches ways of doing that that might not go in the firmware. Sure. That is the case, but we want to hear justification for that so we don't, there will be pushback on that. If there's justification, if you don't have EL3, then obviously that's not going to be possible. We need something there. Currently we have spin table as the alternative boot mechanism there. That has its own share of problems. So if we can get something, if, there, if we can get a common mechanism there, I'm happy. I'm but I, well, I figure I can ta also talk about driver's SOC unless anybody else has anything to say on that topic. Um, so there's been some discussion recently on uh, creating driver's SOC for basically a low level SOC control blocks. Something that I agreed to look at. I'm happy if somebody else wants to take it over, but um, uh, I unfortunately have not had as much time as I want you to spend on it. But um, uh, it, I was thinking that basically the way to handle something like this is to try and set out a few basic rules for what goes in there, because there's obviously a lot of concern. There's a bunch of kind of random repository area for drivers that don't fit anywhere else. So I was thinking of a way to deal with that is just a set of fairly basic rules. And unfortunately, I don't know if I have a really good projector axis. It's probably a waste of time to, to put it in there. But the basic idea is that it would be for MMIO IP blocks that are essentially directly probed from the DT data. So in other words, you, know, you have a, a section of the DT data for this device. It's at a certain memory address. It would wind up loading and driving into that block. Um, was there. Um, and uh, the, the types of IP that would go in here are um, blocks that would be responsible for SOC integration, in quotes. So for example, um, it could be uh, devices that handle a combination of pin mucks, clocks, um, resets, bias control, some types of low-level power management control. 
Um, right now we have, to the extent that those are in the tree, they're either handled just like these random register rights that are scattered throughout the, the DT, basically, or they're placed in some other directory, like, for example, in driver's form or something like that. I, I don't particularly have any objection to, to them living in, in other places, but I think that if there's an IP block that, say, handles both clocks and reset, then it probably doesn't only belong in the clock for example. And then if it goes into somewhere else, then it can just register with both of those other subsystems. And um, it seems like there's a more natural place in terms of maintainership and review in an SOC-specific directory rather than putting it in, say, um, you know, like drivers and the or we're just not going to get any real review done from an SOC. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I missed, might have missed the point of why can't you have, for, say, that IP block, a driver in box and a driver in reset? I think the issue there is that we'd like the DT to describe the hardware as it is, not how Linux is going to use it. So if you've got a block of system registers that is just SOC specific, having a DT node that just says, okay, here's that block of system registers, we can later decompose that arbitrarily within the driver. We might just, for I mean, theoretically, you could forward that on to two different drivers under the hood. You don't get some of the problems people have encountered, like Thomas Petzolini was going on about how they decompose the system register block and realize that actually there was overlap there that was problematic, that ameliorates that, for one thing. So I guess the underlying perspective from a hardware point of view is that, I mean, based on all the hardware I'm familiar with, there are no random blocks of registers scattered throughout the tree that don't exist in some IP block, right? There's, there's generally some IP block, and that's where registers tend to be collected. And so from just a DT generation point of view, if we want the DT to match the hardware, which I think has been one of the principles, at least historically on this, then it kind of makes sense to, to have an entry in the DT for it and to have it probe some kind of driver. There, there's, um, I think Linux will like hooked up the syscon stuff that. I didn't. Oh, that was free scale guys. Oh, free that scale. seems to be working Sean, Sean, pretty, yeah. pretty well for mapping the random register ranges and then uh, so getting up some framework driver for them. So, so that, that would be a first candidate to move over to this subsystem. So I have concerns with Syscon and the way it's used at the moment in that you describe your register region with Syscon and in a lot of cases you then have a lot of other nodes going and referring to yeah, that Syscon right. block rather than having one node for that system controller block that actually says we what it does. Th that, that does often reflect the hardware though because you, do, you often have some random control, uh, the system controller does have so, uh, some yeah. random signal going into the IP block for whatever. Yeah, uh, so it, it it matches the reality of certain socks I've looked at. Yeah, but not always, and it's difficult yeah. to tell without without knowing the sock. Yes, but so, sometimes yeah. it is the same. Well, from yeah. the Syscon has one advantage, which is that <coughs> then the, um, we can implement framework drivers for the consumers, like regulators and blocks and proxies. So uh, if we have something like uh, drivers SOC, then uh, I don't have anything against that, but I would prefer that we don't start exporting a bunch of functions from there that you require that they are set up as Linux generated frameworks that the consumers are using. Yeah. Certainly for things like clocks, right? With the, right. Any driver in, in drivers and so you can register clocks. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so clock and same with pin control. Yeah. We, we have that for like there's a there's a media driver today. Uh, Laurent worked on, I can't remember which one, but that IP block has its own small clock generator in it, right? And so yeah, there's no reason to make something in driver slash clock for that. It just you know, defines his clocks inside of his whatever media drivers. I think an uh, OMAP3 ISP driver is what yeah. it was. Yeah. And then um, just to add some perspective, there's some Qualcomm patches on the list right now. Um, where they, you know, they have their clock drivers in driver slash clock slash QCOM. And um, I guess there's also a voltage regulator control in that same IP block, so they just added you know, voltage regulator definitions and, and ops inside of their existing clock driver. Um, at first, I was I thought it was a little uh, I thought it was a little strange, but you know, honestly, I'm probably going to merge. So you know, it's, you I, I don't know if that should get migrated to another place like Syscon, but it's all one IP block, so I kind of want to. I think it needs to stay together. 
In some of these cases, we need to actually merge the code before we know how long it's enough to write. Yeah. It, it's on a spectrum, right? The pendulum has swung very far in the cleanup direction. Yeah. And you need to pick up two or three implementations before you see it coming out of this. Yeah, so like so I said, we I'm, don't want I'm gonna need to grow out of control, but we need somewhere to put these drivers. Right. Um, one thing that we talked about earlier was to have the there's a need for a place to have like say say you have a DMA in there, right? Well you probably have the core driver for that on the driver's DMA. But you need to allocate resources on that. You need to maybe a small library to allocate channels and stuff like that. Um, that might not fit the DMA and an API. And drivers as a C was back then, sort of, before we called the drivers as a C, was we talked about system library and sort of having a library approach to it instead of a, a sort of a strict driver model approach to it as well. But what are your thoughts on that? Is this, this like the drivers loop or the? Yeah, sort of having a library, like where drivers can rely on actually, you can export function calls and Instead of having a strict driver model for everything in the driver system, so you can have more of a library for this, right? So you're even a driver, and your crypto drivers can both access common functions and do stuff with you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fairly neutral on it only because I haven't really thought through it very deeply from the, the software point of view. I've been mostly thinking of it in terms of trying to, to make our low level drivers match the hardware side. So that's what I would kind of wonder. So in, that, in a way, that's sort of the approach that folks have been taking so far. Many of these IP blocks are always on, and so a lot of times they don't really appear like standard drivers. That are IP blocks that might require enabling or disabling things like that. So um, I guess I would be interested in, in if folks have uh, preferences or reflections on what's good or bad about that approach. It certainly indicate. I, just my personal view is, is pretty much what I've said, is that if there's an IP block on the system, that there should be some driver connected with that, and that all uh, low-level reads and writes to that IP block should be in that driver. I can't tell you how many times I've debug problems in vendor kernels where they're just random MMIO writes scattered around to like, you know, random sysconfig registers or whatever. I think that is what we can avoid with this approach, and we can also review this code if we have kind of a consistent place for it in your driver's SOC, but maybe with the lib, that could also be arranged. So my only concern with that, uh, you mentioned having library functions exported with devices that aren't under the device model. Um, my only concern with that is implicit linkage between devices where you have some device node probed, it tries to go and use this library rather than having an explicit link in the DT to the other device it's going to deal with. And then later on the line, another revision of the SOC comes out where it needs to talk to a slightly different device where you have multiple instances or things like that. So while I'm not bothered about the device model, I would like to see explicit linkage between related devices, having that relationship actually described. So, you were saying that this was for like allocating resources, so you might have some IP block where, I don't know, like a hardware spin lock thing some people have in their IP. If they have a custom driver, yeah, yeah, something Yeah, so if you have that, my chief concern with that, having this library approach, is that another driver for another IP block that makes use of that gets loaded, and in the DT, there's no relationship between these two components described. Yet this, li this driver, by calling into this library, calls into this block, and then a later revision of an SOC comes out with like multiple instances of that block, and you don't uh, know. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. So essentially, you want to make sure that you have a key handle from the, yeah. from the so actual some driver to the shared resource. Yeah, but like I'm not too worried about whether it follows the device model under the hood, so long as we have an explicit linkage, because it makes it yeah. far, far easier. Sure. So with the driver's lib approach, with whatever is under there still register, is the plan to have it register with some existing Linux subsystem, or would it just be kind of a, a set of exported uh, functional calls? So the problem today is that, say that you have some functionality that you need to share between, say, crypto and internet driver, right? There's no place for it today. 
some people today put it under the mark director because that's sort of where the whole is on the digital art brand. But that's going the way. There's not going to be any kind of time on orbit. We're not going to do an R, R64 slash. Some architectures have like SysDev or you know common devices or something. They have a dumping ground. A lot of architectures have that. But we don't have that. And we also need to share it between 32 and 64 bit. So uh, there needs to be a home for that kind of code. Um, the one example that comes to my mind is back on PowerPC we had, um, I had a chip with a GMA engine that provided um, channels to Ethernet, to crypto, to, to actual DMA engine type work. And all that needs to be allocated for me. I could have started to carve it out, but it didn't make sense. I, I wrote a little library, I threw it under my platform right there, but it's still there. Um, but there's no way to put that. Wouldn't it go, if it was a DMA controller, wouldn't it go under some kind of DMA related driver? So why would your Ethernet, so you can't have your Ethernet driver call, call into a driver and the driver's DMA, it doesn't really make sense. It might be a module, right? It might even be loaded. Sort of layering violation type situation. What about MFD? I think it's ugly. Yeah, that's what people said they prefer not to really see MFD. That's not a direct other home for it. Let's see another experiment, I guess. It's just, you know, like going in the same direction in the NPU world. We started with Nets last week. We started with everything last week on the beginning. So everything we could push in the appropriate drivers of this kind of was pushed from there from the very beginning. So we have a fairly good, I believe, a fairly good view of what it's like to it. What piece of pieces of code we could have put in any of these existing driver subsystems. And as far as I remember, um, some examples of things we have in the manual in the UK and the US is some kind of library functions for the form and address service units. So that's good actually for SMP putting up, for CPU idle, for suspend resume, that can be so it's really across IP that's just for various tasks. Um, we have uh, one file that enables the IO currency unit because it's another IO current platform. So we need our, at the moment, we need our own um, DMA operation implementation. Um, so that's also an option that doesn't fit anywhere else, I believe. So, Can um, I ask you a quick question about this? Are, are, are those on that architecture, are those actually separate IP blocks or are these implementations that, that would read and write from multiple? Well, the, the, the way we model things is that we actually wrote you know, a small library or driver um, for each block that we could identify um, as a, a coherent units uh, at another level. So looking at the data sheet, it looks like this register <coughs> are the one that gave us two use register and the one for a coherency fabric. And we created a small C file exposing a few uh, C functions to other SMP uh, or CPU idle or other requires of the code that needed to operate things in these registers. So we created a really one to one mapping between the hardware units and the small driver. But at the moment, these drivers, they don't register into the class model, they don't have any uh, subsystem to register. And I'm not sure it's going to be easy for people to create one because we use really central system register and we have a difference um, across um, SOCs. So, um, how, how do you uh, say, I, don't, I can't remember what the setup for that, those chips were, but if you have multiple chips from different families that all have the same approach of making different registers, how do you connect all of that platform to your library? Right? I mean, how, do you, how do you, I assume the operations are the same, but the registers are different, kind of? Uh, depends on the, on the SOC variant, uh, so there are uh, analog rifle uh, on the SAP to set the address of uh, the CPU is it's using the DMSU on some SOCs. So the DMSU comprises as it goes to the that and denies the difference, the financial difference between the SOCs. But on some other SOCs, it's not using the DMSU, it's using another block. So the SOC code is to be aware of that and know that on one given SOC, if you call the DMSU driver to do that operation, or if you call it to the other thing, in this case, this is the same version. So there's a lot of ad hoc solutions because yeah, we don't have 
good set of interactions with like, all the kind of things. Um, so that's typically what's, what we have left, and we also have left something in the SOC ID, just basically with a revision uh, number from some, some register and step into variables with new runtime decisions on whether to apply this errata or that errata. That's the kind of thing that we have left uh, at least in our platform directly at the moment. So I don't know if that feeds into drivers as you see or not. But typically what we have is something that does register into a subsystem that's something that force a bunch of random functions that will be called by random drivers when you get things done. And the concern we could have with driver SOC as I believe is maybe we will put a bunch of drivers in there. There will be too many of them. So we'll create directories named after the platforms we apply. Not a very yeah. hard patch. Yeah. And we'll yeah, call yeah. the directories <laughs> back. Yeah. And then yeah. guess what we have? Yeah. <laughs> but at least it's shared and it's not outside of the architecture, right? So when you have an SSC that's certificate of one of these permits. True. Yeah. 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 At the end of the day, I mean, we have this problem, right, where each vendor will do their own thing. And where does that go? Another example that comes to mind on is on that EDU. Uh, we had a lot of discussions back about around the MBUS setup, where essentially we ended up creating our own top level driver directory just for that code, right? Where, in hindsight, maybe we should have found a company that didn't like this. But there should be a little bit of a driver stuff. I think it was already there. It was already there. Uh, maybe it was. So there's some whole lot. Yeah, like, well, so there's there's a whole lot. Now, three drivers in there. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Maybe it was a whole lot of drivers that was going to be there for some other list. That particular, something like the L3 or the interconnect, I would say definitely does belong. So one way to keep the driver's SOC under control would be to require all of the stuff there to compile as loadable modules and not export the custom function. Because that way we would be sure that they implement actual existing framework. And that clearly doesn't solve our situation. If you have these constraints, none of the things that I mentioned, we can put in by the Why not? Because they are really simple part, for example, uh, to bring up and um, security secrets, we need the PMSQ code. So if you impose that it has to be a loadable module, no way. Well, well, it can be also compiled in, but it should work and also as a loadable module, because that way we know there's no spaghetti. Well, it's, it's really early in the modules, you know, even have drivers uh, loaded at the moment. So. I think, you know, in terms of the export, Simple stuff in, in, in general. I think I, I would agree. And the goal would be like things like setting the boot address. I suspect that there are many CPUs with many SOCs that do similar things, just maybe in different ways. So it could be that what happens is that organically, as, as those commonalities are perceived, that some kind of subsystem, maybe not a very pleasant subsystem, just in terms of how how well it's demarcated, but grows to to support that. But, but the reason why I'm saying loadable modules is because otherwise it's really hard to review stuff where people sneak in some function into a header and everything's compiled in and suddenly you realize that it's all spaghetti code all over the place where these functions are being called from. Well, that's, uh, that, that's a good point. And actually what I was kind of hoping to do is to enlist, if we do this, to enlist people for the all the the, the second or third level directories, so driver SOC, OMAP, type or whatever, who you know are serious about reviewing this stuff and maybe can help take a look occasionally at each other's patches and how they're running this kind Pretty of Pretty sure we don't want to have a case where only the maintainer of unit code, right? Because that would be one arm maintainer. And we're only the maintainer of the code. We need trust in the maintainer of the I agree completely. But it's still very hard to notice patches you know, where you suddenly have a register, say, register context that function and, and it's called from a couple of places and you only find out like two years later that no crap you can make something into a loadable module because there's this thing in function defining some header somewhere. Oh, yeah, I guess the only thing is how do we, you have something where you need to read some ID 
registers from a block. I assume you have to do that fairly early in your review. Usually that's why I see that super early in the but, but from review point of view, if we can before something gets merged, if we can verify that it at least compiles as a loadable module, we know it doesn't have any of these needy headers. Why not? Uh, oh, because you need to call some but see if you're calling something early. Yeah, 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 but see, that's the idea of this, is that these, these privacy associate things will register functions with standard Linux frameworks, and so if, the, if there's nothing registered, let's say, for an IRT chip or whatever you did earlier, then the function doesn't do anything, but it's still all compiles. And, so and once you register that stuff, it actually does something. We could have it require these things to register with frameworks, but set make that different from the loadable module aspect, right? Right. right, so right. It's, we could have it register with an ID framework that maybe starts yeah. early. Or an SMP. But I would say the loadable module thing should be implemented the same way the IRQ chip is doing it, where nothing happens if you don't have the module loaded, but things don't break either. So it's more like a sanity check for us before merging in code to be able to make sure that there's no sneaky exporting or non exporting functions, but uh, external functions reference the header files. So if you want to do that, how, do you, how would you handle like their use case? Like well, well in, in that use case, what, if you call something early and it's not implemented, and, and the driver says, so see, uh, timer, blah, blah, blah. Loadable mm -hmm. much of naturally that timer won't work. But if, if drivers SOT timer blah 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 is compiled, then you can register uh, early and that way you have the timer available early. So, so we, I know it doesn't exactly play with the current much of init call because it currently requires an ethnet there. But from compiling and merging stuff point of view, it would be nice to be able to test for issues and then when you have it built in. Then it's available early. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to your concern about like speedy calls being split all over the place, I'm not really sure if there's any difference between enforcing loadable modules and enforcing these drivers, SOC drivers, who are never by the default in those SOC files. I think it goes only in the assumption that other pieces of code is that they cannot be used as it doesn't be Except that in, in the second case, you actually allow things that can only work as built in uh, each other. And still, you have the, the list of functions that are important in the control that if the batch adds something into the set of functions that don't really want to the, to the rest of the world, that these interfaces are not great. Because I understand that you have the, yeah. the, the same issue that's that and end up with spaghetti code and this open right. library type of drivers calling with each other and then another driver calling into that yeah. and then running calls. Yeah. Well, you can control but, but exporting function by using and public header files. But you can, you can get away with, you can avoid a lot of that by, uh, rather than trying to initialize everything, you only try to initialize everything possible as late as possible. Because... Uh, I, I understand wish basically the initialization was later. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, there's uh, certainly some cases like on OMEX we have certain couple of blocks that need to be initialized to get timers going, but, but uh, in general we should be able to put user space and then load a bunch of modules that have the system running, like with init parameters. So that's the ideal case. And, and I'm, I'm just, the reason why I'm, I'm ranting about this is because it's, it's really hard to review the code and, and these external functions are being sneaked in continuously and they have just made the word for making things much more, much more harder because nobody's there to clean them up. Well, this is the nice thing I suspect about, if I think we can have a few fairly simple review guidelines to watch for that. I mean, we can say, for example, that every function in these, in these, in these, the files there needs to be static. And if it's not right. static, we look point. at it with the super sharp magnifying. Yeah. <coughs> That's a good one, yeah, that would achieve a lot of... We can even do that with the script. Right? Yeah, and, so. and no exporting custom functions. 
Well, I mean, or if, if, if they need, somebody does do it, then we need to have some kind of plan in place for how to transition that to a framework, yeah. basically. Well, we use yeah. a share of machine display for all the drivers on the new share that they will say functions. Or do you have, like, uh, exported functions per driver that are sort of different, or do you tend to use the same interface? Is that one mixed pizza? I mean, I. I'm not sure if this directly answers your question, but I tend to think of it in kind of nomad terms where you know, we have these blocks that have clock control and reset control and maybe some PM control based in. And the goal would ideally be for all of those to register with some other framework other elsewhere in the tree and ideally not export anything. So, that, that doesn't, I'm sorry. I'm not sure. I may have misunderstood your no, question. No. Yeah, that fits very well in our model, but where, it, where it's a little bit harder is for Thomas' case, where it's sort of the long tail of little miscellaneous things that they need here and there in the code. And yes, it could be spaghetti code, but at the same time, <coughs> where else would that go? You can't have a, have a setup where, because chances are that these are going to be slightly different in each other. So you're going to have everybody build a little bit of a framework and register two function calls, three deaths, and so Well, that's the idea, it's a bad example, because everybody's probably like it. But um, every time there's something that's different between numbers, and requiring them all to create a one-hour framework for it is also work. Yeah, I'm certainly open to other, other ways to approach that. I don't know if it's But it's also going to point us very quickly to this subsystem that we're missing or slight pressure. Yeah. If everybody's doing it a one-off way, we'll say, well, this is where we do this is the first and this is the next subsystem. This is right. a little bit of the problem we have today where we're trying to be so clean that we don't let the crap build up. Yeah. Unless we let a little bit of crap build up. We don't see anything. But it's nice to all the crap in one spot. Yeah. The spot. <laughs> well, well, this is how bad it is. How bad it will be before it's over. <laughs> Anyone want to take up the role of maintaining this? Drivers <laughs> crop. <laughs> 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 I did propose we should still merge into our own so we get the, the cross number. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine with that. The only thing that occurred to me about that as I was thinking about it is that hopefully it is not only our mess to see. Yeah, that was about yeah, to be my so question. Sure. Is there going to be some pushback when there's a MIPS or RPC set of drivers that go with the driver's software? Okay, so let's put it in a different tree then. Okay. Right. Yeah, you know, somebody should have to do it. Yeah, no, I don't think I go through that. I just Well, you know, we'll start it through our message. See if you can do it. Yeah, somebody can change it. So, yeah, maybe what I'll do is I had a couple other rules, and obviously if there's some good ones just from the discussion, but maybe I'll just send it out and be on this post, and then we can plan it all to death. But keep, also, I think I would say keep yourselves in mind if you have people who you know would be good reviewers or cross-reviewers for this kind of a thing. I mean, they should be relatively experienced with these matters and also sufficiently cynical, which I think you know, is still a good cross-section there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we should, we should definitely try and have a lot of eyes. Okay, so earlier on you said, when, with regards to the S&P thing, that people may be doing stuff and they're not able to talk about it here. I'm here if you need to talk about that, if there's, because if we can organize things so that we avoid problems, that's for the best. Yeah, the same is true, you know, we tend to talk to most of the team maintainers one by one. Thank you.